Welcome to week 13. We're talking about interval estimations this week, and we're going to get started with an introduction to estimation. A very common use for statistics is to estimate population parameters. We often do not know the mean or the standard deviation of a population, and our solution for that is to take a sample from the population, and what we learn about the sample, we will apply back to the population. In this case, we have a sample of size 30, and the mean of the sample is 4.8. And so what we will determine is that, in general, the best estimate for our population mean is our sample mean. That's estimation. And we've done that previously. We've done that in previous weeks. What we're going to do is build upon that. So for example, when we take a sample, we might offer statistics such as these. We might say that a sample of college-age males is 5 foot 11 inches tall. Therefore, 5 foot 11 is our best point estimate for the population mean. Or we can do this with a proportion. 64% of a sample of Missouri residents support Medicaid expansion. So therefore, 64% is our best point estimate of the population proportion. But there is a problem with these point estimates, and that is the question of certainty. How certain are you that 64% of the public will vote for Medicaid expansion? Or how certain are you, how confident are you, that the average college-age male is 5 foot 11 inches tall? How close is your point estimate to the actual population mean? To answer this question, we're going to use something called confidence intervals. Instead of a point estimate, which is very specific, but likely to be incorrect, we're going to come up with a range of scores into which the true population mean is likely to fall 95% of the time. It's a range, which means it's non-specific, but it is accurate. It is most of the time going to capture the true population mean. And here's what it would look like we see the population mean, which is greater than a number at the lower limit of the range and less than a number at the upper limit of the range. This confidence interval is a range of values that contains the population parameter 95% of the time. Now that percentage may be adjusted. So we could set it at 90% or 99% or we could set it at 94.2%, which we might do for some of the homework examples. It is computed using the population standard deviation, or sigma, which is great, except in the cases where we don't actually know the population value. And in that case, what we're going to do is estimate the population value from the sample. That is going to have some implications for the way that we do the math, and we're going to spend some time talking about that with degrees of freedom. In order to figure out the confidence interval, we need to know what is 95% of our normal curve. And to do that, we could calculate that using the math, but I want to point you to the normal distribution multi-tool that we've been using previously. And if you look on the tab for the Z formula, you will see box number 7 that says finding an x value for a given probability. And this is the box that we're going to use to answer the question, what would be a cutoff score for 95% of the population? 95% within that range, leaving 5% split between each of the two tails. 2.5% in the upper and the lower tail. To use this, let's enter a mean and a standard deviation. We'll use a standard normal curve, which has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Next, we'll enter our probability, which we've said is 0.05, leaving 95% of, of the scores within the range. When we enter our 0.05, we see both tails. An x value with half of 0.05 in each tail is a value of 1.96, which we would describe as z sub 0.95 equals positive or negative 1.96. This is going to be a very important value that we'll see occurring again and again. In a normal distribution, 
95% of the scores are bounded by positive and negative 1.96 standard deviations. In this case, the values for the normal curve are a mean of 71, a standard deviation of 5.17, and our sample size is 30. We can use the standard deviation divided by the square root of n to calculate the standard error of the mean. Using sigma divided by the square root of n, we will then add, we'll multiply that by 1.96, and then either add or subtract it from our point estimate, the mean, to give us the range or the 95% confidence interval. It will look a bit like this. Here is our normal curve. Here is our upper limit, which is the point estimate plus 1.96 times our standard error of the mean. And our lower limit is our point estimate minus 1.96 times our standard error. Well, let's do this in Excel. For this, we're going to use the week 13 intervals Excel spreadsheet. And we'll start with the ICU data tab. On the ICU data tab, we'll start by creating our randomization variable, which is, put your cursor in G2, and equal sign, R-A-N-D, open parentheses, close parentheses. And this will create a random number. We're going to copy this random number down our column by double-clicking on the small box in the lower right corner. The first 30 cells will automatically be selected as our sample, but we want a random sample, so what we're going to do is sort by this random number. Go to Data, Sort. It is possible that you will get a warning saying that only the random variable has been selected, and of course, if you do, it's very simple. The default selection is to expand the selection, so just click on Sort. This will open our sorting window. We want to sort on the column random, sort on values, order smallest to largest, and then click OK. In the results box, we see that our alpha is 0 0.05. That is the alpha level that we're using for a 95% confidence interval. That alpha level 0.05 is what corresponds to a 0.95 confidence interval. We see with our sigma known, our margin of error is 0.149828. Our point estimate is drawn from the mean, and our upper and lower limits are defined by adding the margin of error to the point estimate or subtracting the margin of error from the point estimate. Now these numbers may be different for your sample because each of these random samples is different from each other. So let's experiment with this alpha level a little bit. Let's change it from 0 0.05, which is a 95% confidence interval, to a 0 0.10, which would correspond to a 90% confidence interval. You can check that in the box. You will see 90% confidence interval up here. It's referencing that coefficient, which we call our confidence coefficient. Our margin of error changes. Our point estimate will remain the same. Our upper and lower limit will expand or contract depending upon how we set our confidence interval. So for instance, if we change our alpha level again, this time to a 0 0.01, we now have a 99% confidence interval, which you notice will be a little bit wider. It has to be wider in order to encompass more scores within that range. Each one of us has created our own random sample. Well, let's imagine that we have 100 students in the class, each following along with this example, everyone creating their own random sample. Each experiment is creating a confidence interval, so we now have 100 samples with 100 confidence intervals. 95 of those 100 intervals, on the average, would contain the population mean, and 5% of those intervals would not contain the population mean. And here's what this would look like. 
we have a distribution for the population. There is a mean right there in the middle of our normal curve. Each of these lines is representing a confidence interval that was computed by a student in class. Out of the 100 confidence intervals, 95 of them would contain the mean, and there would be five that, through random chance, would not contain the mean of the population. You see, this interval does not contain the mean, and that interval does not contain the mean. So 95 of the cases, or 95% of the examples, 95% of the time, we have contained the mean within our confidence intervals. We would say that the interval has been established at the 95% confidence level. Our confidence coefficient is the confidence level expressed as a probability. So 95%, we have 0.95. The most common confidence levels are 90, 95, and 99%, which would correspond to alpha levels of 0 0.10, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. And the Z values associated with each of those cutoff scores are 1.645, the 1.96 that we saw earlier, and 2.576. So what does that 95% confidence really mean? How should we describe 95% confidence? The best way is to keep it in terms of our level of confidence. So the best way to say it, the safest way to say it would be, we are 95% confidence that the interval that we have created includes the population mean. It's tempting to say the interval has a 0.95 probability of containing the population mean. And yes, that is true, but it's, it's more complex than that. There are other factors that might change that interval. So these numbers apply for this study only. But with other studies, the confidence intervals will be different. Therefore, the safest way for us, for us to describe this 95% confidence interval, especially if we were doing a write-up, is to say that we are 95% confident that our interval, interval includes the population. <laughs>